Who are the Toronto Defiant? Now, I'm not asking you to name everybody on the roster or in the organization. I want to go deeper than that. Like, what did this team stand for? What was their signature playstyle? What was their plan for success? Who are they? And it's really weird because when I think about these questions, I can't find a conclusive answer. Now, maybe I'm just really stupid. That is a valid possibility, but I think there's something else. I think the Defiant went through so many drastic changes as a team and as an organization that it's tough to really pin them down. This team has only existed for one season, yet their former player list is already longer than their active player list. Yeah, we have a lot to get through. So welcome to the complicated story of the Toronto Defiant. The Toronto Defiant were one of the two Canadian expansion teams added to Overwatch League in Season 2. This team is owned by Overactive Media, a quote, integrated global company delivering esports and video game entertainment. OAM is a fairly new player in the esports game, but has quickly grown and now sits pretty much at the top of the food chain. One reason for this is the incredible experience in their uppermost staff. Take their president and CEO, Chris Overholt. Before founding OAM, Overholt had spent time as a CMO for the Miami Dolphins, the Vice President for the Florida Panthers, and the CEO of the Canadian Olympic Committee. This was his first venture into esports, but the transition would be pretty smooth thanks a lot to their partnership with Splice. Splice is a very well-known esports franchise, they own successful teams in games like League of Legends and Call of Duty, and Splice would be the team in charge of putting together and operating the Defiant. These investments seemed to pay off, as there was a lot to be excited about when Toronto announced their roster. First of all, Bishop would be making his big return as head coach. For those unfamiliar, Bishop started Overwatch League Season 1 as the head coach of the London Spitfire, and he was with the team when they took home the Stage 1 title. Midway through Season 1, however, Bishop ended up being forced to step down. So, while I was with London, uh, I had to unfortunately step down from the position of head coach during stage two due to uh, my mother being diagnosed with cancer at the time, breast cancer. Um, it was a difficult time, uh, but now she has fully recovered. God bless. I was honestly really glad that Bishop got another chance at the league after being forced out due to such unfortunate circumstances. So around Bishop, the team brought on assistant coach Bubbly, who spent season one as a coach for the Seoul Dynasty, strategic coach Don, who was moving over after being a part of the LA Valiant last year, and analyst Baroy, who has no prior Overwatch League experience, but is credited as the main mind behind Winston's Lab, a popular third-party Overwatch League analytics site back in season one. Winston's Lab would end up going almost completely dark, as Baroy spent most of his time working with Toronto. Rest in peace, my friend. With a promising coaching staff assembled, it was time for Toronto to build their roster. Now, the first thing to talk about here are the two major Overwatch League veterans that the Defiant signed. The first was Neko, and this was a massive pickup. As a member of the Boston Uprising in Season 1, Neko was often considered to be a top 5 player in the world on Zenyatta. Unfortunately, he ended up fighting with Aim God a lot for the starting flex support spot near the end of the season. So the Defiant offered an opportunity to get away from that and to a team that he knew he'd be on stage for. And this was a player that a lot of people were really hyped up about. The second was Envy. In Season 1, Envy started out as a starting off tank on the LA Valiant, and he was actually a really solid duo with Fate. Envy was considered to be one of the better flex tanks in the league, but then, all of a sudden, he was gone. Envy just left the team. Why he did that was never fully addressed, there's tons of unconfirmed rumors out there, but the Valiant had space turning 18, so they would be fine. Envy would go back down to contenders and have a solid year with Metabellum before getting his second call-up. It's also worth mentioning that the team grabbed Asher from the LA Gladiators. Asher was a solid player in Season 1, but was mostly used as a Tracer 1-trick, riding the bench most of the time when she was out of the meta. Still, these were three players with Overwatch League experience that were used to supplement the team of rookies that accompanied them. Bishop and the Defiant definitely wanted a team that would go into Overwatch League with a lot of pre-existing synergy. 
They wanted to poach a top contenders Korea team almost in its entirety, but maybe didn't have the money to commit to a team like Runaway or Element Mystic. Instead, Toronto looked to a team called O2 Ardeont. DPS Ivy, Main Tank Yakpung, Main Support Rocky, and DPS Stellar all came from this squad. Now, I have to admit that I've never watched O2 and Contenders, but their results show a team that wasn't at the top, but could have broken out at any moment. In 2018 Season 1, O2 only went 2 and 3 in their group stages, but upset Element Mystic in the playoffs on their way to a second place finish. Meanwhile, in Season 2, they went 4 and 1, but they were the ones who ended up getting upset in the quarterfinals. This team was pretty under the radar, as people were talking about potential Season 2 pickups. But this was a team that was highly respected and even feared in Korea. They never were quite able to put it together, but they were very close to doing so. Not to mention there was a lot of hype around some individual players of this squad, like Ivy and Yakpung. It was a bit of a gamble on the part of the Defiant, but these players really could be a steal. The final piece of their roster was Aid, who joined up from GGEA. If you watched a few of my other episodes, you know that GGEA wasn't that good, but this was due to management more than players, and we really shouldn't be blaming the players too much for that. Aid would be another solid main support player who they could swap out with Roki if they felt was necessary. So as we were gearing up for the season to begin, most people weren't sure about the Defiant. They weren't super familiar with the O2 core, and while pieces like Neko and Envy were good, they weren't good enough that people thought they could carry a team to anything more than a playoff spot. It was great to have Bishop back, but no one really knew what to expect of him after his long absence. Because of this, almost all preseason power rankings placed Toronto in the bottom half of the league. But Toronto opened up their debut season with a bang. Even though Neko had to serve a three-game suspension for account selling and obstructing investigation, the Defiant showed a level of coordination that could only be achieved by a squad that has mostly been playing together for years. In a GOATS meta, Ivy was the star on Zarya. He was able to maintain a high energy on the hero and pump out massive damage. Valley making sure they do that without anyone getting picked off. Fate close to an Earth Shadow, but that's about it for the Valiant. That's the EMP though. Three players caught by that one, but Kareeva Custer fight back. It's a 4v4 now with the Graviton Surge. Ziaski has going to have to go for the Transcendence, and it's not enough to keep space up, even with the huge amount of healing it provides. Ivy was discorded, but then his own buffer will remove that damage booster from him, and he can chase down the dregs of the Valiant. It was indeed a staunch defense from Los Angeles, but eventually Toronto break through. The team also took advantage of Envy's flexibility, putting him on Sombra a lot of the time. They were actually one of the first teams to play this Sombra Goats comp, and Envy Sombra was surprisingly great considering we've only ever really seen him on D.Va before. But while the individual play was good, the real bread and butter for Toronto was their coordination. They were insanely good at setting up set plays on the fly, forcing the other team into terrible positions, and then Yakpon would land a huge shatter, or Envy would destroy him all with the D.Va bomb, or Ivy would just kill everyone. Toronto's only losses in Stage 1 would come against the Rain and the NYXL, and they would beat future playoff teams like the Spark and the Hunters. This performance allowed the Defiant to qualify for the Stage 1 playoffs as the third seed, where they promptly had their hopes crushed by the Shock. But there was a lot of optimism to be found here. The Defiant have given fans a playoff berth in their first stage ever, showing a lot of individual skill and team coordination, establishing themselves as a team to watch. What could possibly go wrong? Between stages 1 and 2, Toronto took a few substantial hits. The first was strategic coach Dawn, who quietly left the team, but the second one... Man, looking back, Stellar's retirement really marked the beginning of the downward spiral. This came out of nowhere, and while Stellar was never a huge contributor in the kill feed, that's what you get for playing Brig, he was obviously doing a lot of work through comms and his consistent supportive playstyle which set up his teammates to succeed. 
With him gone, Toronto found themselves in a really tough spot. They had to find a replacement. The replacement had to be one of the best DPS players in the world, they had to be able to speak Korean, and they had to be able to get to LA pretty much immediately. Finding someone like that on such short notice is almost impossible. Under those conditions, the Defiant would find probably the best choice in I'm 37. Now, I'm 37 is actually a really fun case, because this is what he did, right? I'm 37 has always been known as a really good DPS player and ranked, he queued with XQC a lot on his streams, but he didn't have any professional experience, he was just a ladder player. I'm killing it, I'm killing it. Oh, I'm 37. Oh. Let's go. Excuse me, we did Let's everything. Go. Let's go. On March 14th, he joined Wavecheck, a new team that was climbing through North American Open Division. Ten days later, he left Wavecheck to join Second Wind in North American Contenders. He played a total of one game with Second Wind before being picked up by the Defiance a week later. This rise through the ranks was unprecedented, and gave I'm 37 the title of the first ever Path to Pro speedrunner. A lot of really cool memes were made of this, including an official Overwatch League sketch. <sighs> But as funny as that was, when the speedrunner joined the team and took the stage, things got ugly fast. Ivy had made his name in stage 1 on Zarya. He was really good at it. But either the coaching staff really liked I'm 37 Zarya, or they absolutely hated his brig. Because when stage 2 started, it was I'm 37 on the Zarya and Ivy on Brigitte, which just didn't work. Like I said, the Defiant's biggest strength in Stage 1 was their team-wide coordination. When you took Stellar out of the lineup and you moved the other DPS around, everything fell apart. All of a sudden, Yakpung started feeding, Envy wasn't getting any more great bombs. The support line was inconsequential. It didn't matter whether Aid or Roki were alongside Neko. In Stage 2, Toronto's record would flip. They went 2-5, only winning games against Washington and Paris. Any advantage that they had after Stage 1? It was completely erased, and the Defiant had an avalanche of momentum against them. Things were not looking good for the squad in black and red. Okay, so the Defiant are in a rough spot right now. They're barely holding on to a playoff spot, but it's slipping fast, and frankly, I don't think even their own organization believed in their ability to turn it around. So maybe they thought it was calculated, their best chance to win, or maybe it was just slamming the panic button, but Toronto started a flurry of roster changes. The first was the promotion of Tank Lang Sharik and Gods from their academy team, the Montreal Rebellion. Now this was actually a monumental move in Overwatch League history, because there's been several times where you've seen all NA, EU, or Chinese teams move to a mix setup by adding some Korean players. But this was the first and currently only time in Overwatch League history that we've seen it happen the other way, where an all-Korean team picked up Western players. And these players weren't bad either, picking up a semi-final finish in their first season of Contenders together. A few weeks later, the team would end up shipping off Envy to the Dragons. Good choice? Bad choice? I don't know. Envy was obviously a key part of the Defiance plan when the season started, but for one reason or another, that fell apart. What I can tell you for sure is this move committed gods as their starting off tank. These western players weren't just going to be sitting on the bench. Joining these two in the western renaissance was Logix and Mangachu. Now, Overwatch League fans would know Logix as the best part of the early Florida mayhem, practically carrying them to any wins they got with his Widow and his Tracer. After getting cut, Logix hung around in Tier 2, playing for XL2, and then Montreal on his way to a second Overwatch League team. Mangachu has been hanging around forever. You might recognize him as the third best DPS in Canada behind Sure 4 and Agilities, often being the third person on the Canadian Overwatch World Cup team. Mangachu has often been known as a silly hero specialist in a far one trick, but he's been grinding in Tier 2 for a long time to widen his hero pool, and you'd be hard pressed to find someone who didn't think he deserved a spot in Overwatch League. 
In the same time frame, Asher also retired from Overwatch. I don't think he ever actually got stage time in Season 2, and if he did, it was very minimal. But he was a decent depth player on DPS that Toronto could no longer work with. So after making these monumental roster changes, setting Overwatch League history, getting a new lease on life, the Defiant went back on stage and went 0-7. Yeah, it sucked. The Defiant basically had an entirely new team at this point. In fact, I'm actually going to call this team Toronto 2, because I don't think it's fair to consider Stage 1 Defiant and Stage 3 Defiant as the same thing. I mean, they played like they were starting over. They weren't sure whether to run Yakpon or Sharik on main tank, they didn't know how to best play around their admittedly talented new DPS core. They played more like a GM ranked game than an Overwatch League game. And that would be fine if it was stage one, but now you're against teams who have been on stage together for months. And I don't blame the players for this. They were put in an awful situation. Even the best players in the world would have struggled if put into their shoes. Like, you know how every year the Korean Overwatch World Cup team does a show match against the winner of Contenders Korea, and they always lose because they just started playing together while the Contenders team has a ton of synergy? It's like that. The Toronto Defiant were just unprepared for the level of competition that they would face, and because of that, they would join the exclusive 0-7 club. I'm honestly not sure how much more I can add on here, because Stage 4 was basically just an extension of Stage 3. Toronto tried to stem the bleeding by adding on some new coaching, promoting OptiDocs from the Rebellion, and signing Moby Dick from O2, probably to bring some familiarity to both sides of the team. But at this point, the season was lost. Toronto was just too far behind at this point, both in the standings and in overall synergy. They would show some signs of life in Stage 4, pulling off a win against Shanghai to avoid going 0-14, and taking maps off of almost every team they faced, but that was it. I legitimately believe that the lineup we saw in Stage 4 could have had a decent amount of success at Overwatch League if they had been together since the beginning of the season, but that's not the circumstance that they were put in. Toronto experienced probably the biggest nosedive we've ever seen in Overwatch League, from tied for third place at the end of Stage 1 to 17th at the end of the season. Needless to say, the Defiant did not make the playoffs. So, now I hope you understand why I have so much trouble summing up this team. Toronto started the season red hot, showing a surprising amount of individual skill and even more coordination. But after Stellar left between stages 1 and 2 and Toronto had to scramble for a replacement, everything fell apart. No, not just that. The team imploded on itself. The Defiant had more wins in stage 1 than their last three stages combined. You almost have to consider Stage 1 Defiant and Stage 2 to 4 Defiant as separate entities entirely, because that's what I felt like as I was looking back, and this makes them very difficult to evaluate. With that in mind, I need to focus on the concrete information. Three awful stages, 0 and 7 in Stage 3, and 17th place overall. Even though Stage 1 was pretty good, that can't cancel out the fact that Toronto was just awful for three-fourths of the season. That's why my final rating for the Toronto Defiant in Season 2 of the Overwatch League is a D. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed looking back on the Toronto Defiant season as much as I did. Do you think this team made the right decisions as the season went on? How about next season with their completely retooled, mostly Western roster? How do you think the Defiant will fare in Season 3? Let me know in the comments! Be sure to leave a like on this video if you liked it, and subscribe with notifications on to make sure you don't miss a single episode of Sir. And as always, let's see where in the world we'll be going next. Jeez, that was right on the edge, Wheel. A little indecisive? Alright, so London next. How did the reigning champs fare in Season 2? You'll find out soon enough on the next episode of Season in Review. Until then, though. Don't get tilted.